When doing a full gold crown prep, such as this one on number 30, uh, the first thing that you're going to do is occlusal reduction. Occlusal reduction takes down the entire occlusal table by one and a half millimeters in order to make enough room for the gold uh, of the restoration. You start occlusal reduction by making depth cuts. Depth cuts are one millimeter cuts that you make in the occlusal table's grooves and or on the triangular ridges. Uh, personally, I make them in the grooves and that gives me enough of a marker to be able to take down the entire occlusal surface while maintaining the inclines of the cusps as they currently are and take it all down by about one to one and a quarter millimeter. Uh, the burr that we use for this is the 57 um, carbide. <clears throat> it's a straight carbide burr that is one millimeter in diameter. So by the time you make your depth cuts, you should have a one millimeter reduction wherever you made your depth cuts. Now you join these grooves as I start doing here. So you place it back in one of your depth cuts and then you drag it along, recreating the incline or rather maintaining the incline uh, while you connect from one depth cut to the next. Now I'm doing the uh, mesiolingual cusp here and you proceed this way along the entire occlusal table until you get around one to one and a quarter millimeter of reduction. Um, we eventually want to end up with one and a half. Uh, so you might ask, why not start with a bigger burr? And the idea is that you don't want to uh, do too much occlusal reduction. Part of the reason why we do occlusal reduction first is to make sure that we still have about three millimeters of axial walls where we can place the crown. And ideally, you want the finish line to be above the level of the gingiva. It's better periodontally for the patient, it's easier to place and verify, and it's easier to capture in an impression. Therefore, you want to do the minimum amount of occlusal reduction that is necessary to have a good gold restoration. If you use the 57, your initial occlusal reduction will leave you with some amount of, let's say, leave room uh, to make sure that you can go back and touch up the occlusal reduction and ensure that it is one and a half millimeters. Uh, or if you need to smooth out certain areas uh, or make small changes here and there. What I'm doing here is placing the functional cusp bevel. Uh, the functional cusp bevel basically makes it so that um, you replicate the bevel on the buccal cusps of the mandibular teeth and the lingual cusps of the maxillary teeth. Uh, in this case, by placing the functional cusp bevel, you will see how much occlusal clearance you really have, and you ensure that the cusp tips are in line with all the other adjacent teeth. At this point, you're going to have to find your maxilla and place both of them together to check for occlusal reduction. As you can see here, I do not have that much. That's because I did not make my functional cusp bevel as heavily as I should, a very common mistake. At this point, I'm going and re-emphasizing uh, my um, functional cusp bevel as well as taking down certain portions of my occlusal table, which I did not take down initially as heavily as I should have. Another important thing to remember when you're doing the occlusal reduction is that you don't actually need to go all the way to the ends of the occlusal table. This is because by the time you do your axial reduction, you will take off certain portions of the occlusal table completely off the tooth. So those areas don't need to be touched. Uh, this is especially true for exam scenarios where you want to stay somewhat away from the adjacent tooth as making an adjacent tooth is an automatic failure. Remember to periodically blow uh, on your prep and make sure that you keep the surfaces as smooth as possible. Let's check again. And this time we can see a pretty clear gap. So I take my RGS3 and try to slide it through. As I slide through the mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary, I notice it catches. So I know I have to go back and do a little bit more occlusal reduction in the mesial buccal and the distal buccal areas of the mandibular tooth. When you're touching up these specific cusps, make sure that every time you do a little bit more occlusal reduction, you will also have to increase your functional cusp bevel. Let's check again.
Now I'm checking the lingual portion of the prep by closing my type it on and taking my RGS3 from where the patient's uh, throat would be. And I see that there's perhaps just a couple areas in the lingual, like the cusp tips, uh, where I need to touch it up a little bit more and make sure that I have the full one and a half millimeters. Uh, a quick note about checking occlusal clearance. When you have done sufficient amount of occlusal reduction, the 1.5 millimeters is checked by using your RGS3. Your RGS3 needs to be very loosely able to fit in between the teeth. Now, if your RGS4 fits, that generally signifies that you have more than one and a half millimeters, which is on the excessive side. Another final check this time. And as you can see, the RGS3 goes through without catching on anything. Uh, and it seems fairly loose. So therefore, I'm pretty sure I've gotten my one and a half millimeters. What I'm doing here is trying to take down any sharp points uh, that could be potentially um, difficult to deal with later on uh, or could throw off, um, the, throw off the angulation of the burr when you're trying to do the axial reduction. Okay, so now we're going to begin axial reduction with the 878 burr. Uh, you see me doing a little practice swing there, trying to um, get my motion. And what I'm doing now is I'm taking the burr to the adjacent teeth to ensure that I have it placed at the right angle in order to get draw. You start generally in the middle and you can place depth cuts if you'd like. Uh, since this is a full gold crown, the finish line we're going to use is a chamfer. Um, and the 878 is a chamfer diamond. By placing this tapered diamond burr roughly vertical or somewhat leaned in uh, as dictated by adjacent teeth, you can take down the buckle surface, the 0.3 to 0.7 millimeters where the finish line is and a lot more uh, where the cusps flare outwards. With the 878, the goal is to get your chamfer around the buccal surfaces and the lingual surfaces, but you don't necessarily break the contact with the 878. You take it in as much as possible without nicking the adjacent tooth, but you don't need to break the contact with the larger 878. There's a better burr in your black uh, burr block that is used to break contact between adjacent teeth and any sort of uh, indirect prep. And that's what I'm retrieving right here. This is the 850. It's the 850-010. Uh, this is just a little bit thinner and uh, it's ideal for breaking through the contact. The 850, you basically place where you left off making your chamfer on the buckle portion of the tooth and you start drilling through the inner proximal. When you're drilling through the inner proximal, it's very important to keep it such that it doesn't nick the adjacent tooth. And the easiest way to do this is to keep your angulation as it should be, leaning ever so slightly towards the tooth and leaving a thin shell of enamel or ivory in this case to prevent your burr from touching the adjacent tooth. Let's take a look. As you can see, I've reached the inner proximal contact and now I'm going to have to be extremely careful so as to not nick any adjacent teeth. It also helps if you have a very steady hand, but if you do not, as is the case for me, you can, re you can increase the speed of your uh, burr's uh, rotation, i.e. step down on the rheostat uh, in order to actually have it cut in a smoother fashion. Uh, keep taking in, uh, keep taking your burr into the inner proximal. Uh, in this case, I'm doing both the distal and the mesial inner proximals around the same time, as you can see but you don't have to do this. Generally, it's better to work on one inner proximal all the way through than work on the other, to each their own. Another quick check. I've made it around halfway through the inner proximal contact, so I'm gonna continue on. 
for those of you who are struggling with the 850 and getting the interproximal um, break, the 8850 is a much finer grit diamond burr that is also somewhat thinner at the tip. It's worth trying if you're really, really struggling uh, and you keep nicking your adjacent uh, tooth. It's also worth mentioning that you can get other burrs um, in the market which are much smaller in diameter, such as an 850-010 or a one millimeter 850 instead of the 1.2 we have. So now I switch back to the 878 because I'm making the chamfer on the lingual side of my uh, number 30 here. Again, we have to check draw. So make sure that your burr angulation is appropriate. If the walls of your preparation do not converge, the crown that you make will not fit. So having checked my draw, I begin prepping the lingual uh, surface. And again, it's the same general motion. You place it such that you have at least three millimeters of axial wall. You work in large, broad, steady swings in order to keep your finish line fairly um, uniform all the way around the gingiva. Here you can see me try to take the chamfer as far into the inner proximal as I can. But again, the 878 is not going to be the burr that I use to break through the contact. As you can see, there's very little of the inner proximal left now on the lingual side. Uh, so I switch back to my 850 and I'm ready to go through the distal. I'm being as careful as I can so as to not create an undercut because if the burr is angled incorrectly, you can create an undercut which becomes rather difficult later on uh, to remedy. Another useful trick when you're trying to uh, take it into the inner proximal and not leave any undercuts is to make sure that you keep coming back and planing the surface in order to make sure that your lingual or buckle walls uh, do not have any sharp corners such that there's a very smooth transition between where you have your chamfer and where you start breaking your contact. It'll also help you uh, eventually when you're uh, finished with your prep. So having completed the distal uh, interproximal contact break, I'm now going to work on the mesial, again with the 850 burr. Having mostly completed it, at this point, I'm simply refining my axial walls. Um, and since the contact has been broken through, I switched back to my 878 in order to make the inner proximal areas chamfers as well. Now, it's very crucial to remember that the finish line needs to be 0.5 millimeter above the gingiva, but the gingiva isn't just a parallel um, arrangement of soft tissue. The gingiva goes up and down in various places and your finish line must too. Once you've completed making your chamfer uh, in the interproximal regions, at this point I'm simply refining my prep. I switch over to a very fine uh, diamond burr uh, known as the 8877. Uh, and this 8877 is a parallel diamond burr with a round end. And what it does, it lets me remove any um, sharp corners in my occlusal table uh, that were created because the 80 or, or the 57 burr that we used initially can leave a lot of really sharp features in the prep. The 8877 is also ideal to make your finish line as smooth as possible and smooth out any imperfections in your axial walls. It has the perfect shape to maintain your chamfer margin that you created and make it very, very clean when it comes to capturing it for an impression or trying to make a temp. The 8877 is also thin enough to go through the inner proximal, assuming you've done sufficient axial reduction.
If your 8877 is not going through, you need to do more axial reduction. Having gone once around the entire tooth with the 8877, I'm nearly completed with my prep. The only thing I want to do at this point is ensure that I take away any of the little cusp tips that are still sharp, even after going over them with the 8877. And for this, the best burr to use is your 7404. It's also important now to place your non-functional cusp bevel, which is 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters, i.e. just one quick, smooth stroke along the cusp tips of the non-functional cusps, or the lingual cusps in this case. The 7404 is also a very gentle burr that can uh, remove sharp corners, especially on the cusp tips, uh, as I said, which could not be removed with the 8877. A final check to ensure that occlusal clearance of 1.5 has been reached, and a quick check of the entire margin shows that in the distal, there is one area where the tooth is not or where the margin is not completely flat, and that needs to be fixed. So I switch back here to my 88 or to my 850 to make sure that I get that one small area where the margin is not flat. The goals of your full gold crown prep are to have 6 to 10 degrees of taper. And if you've achieved that, you're finished.